Hey guys, it's me again, and it's another week of cold weather. That's why I wear two shirts. The inner shirt is actually like a sweater. It's actually very warm, and I wear also a hoodie too, which have some foam here. So it's actually very very warm too to keep me warm. Even though in my room I've closed the door, there's no air conditioner, no fan out here, but it's still cold. That's why I wear this worm. And today I just finished learning online, and I was thinking, I look at my bookcase. Why do I read some books again? Yeah, that's why I'm sitting in here, the place that I usually learn online. And today I will read chapter. Can you guess what chapter is it? If you can remember, then hooray! You are my super fan. So can you remember the chapter? Of course. I hope you remembered. Today it is chapter seven. Today I will read chapter seven for you to hear. It was so amazing because last time, finally Shirley and also Kevin and Archie go to the same house. I'm sure you know they could be friends in the future, and they are at Mrs. Waverly's house. Although Mrs. Waverly accept these three, she's not very happy about it. Like especially for Kevin because nobody wanted to choose Kevin because he was a tall and thin boy. But yeah, he was chosen. Actually, he's not chosen, but he just stayed there for a couple of days until he was found by a new billet. So let's get started in chapter seven. What will they do in Miss Waverly's house? All right. Mrs. Henshaw and Mr. Bentley left immediately, quickly saying goodbye to Kevin, Archie, and me. I think they were scared Mrs. Waverly might change her mind if they dithered. We stood there uncertainly in the large, dark, boat-like room, not knowing what to say or do. I looked at Mrs. Waverly hopefully. She seemed to have taken a shine to me. She said I could stay because I like reading, as she obviously did. She let Kevin stay too because I had begged her. I expected her to sit up properly and start a conversation about books, but she gazed at me helplessly, not saying a word. Then she turned to Chubby. Now, look what you got into. Chubby declared, "What do you propose we do with them?" Mrs. Waverly claps her hands together, frowning. "Why? We'll give them supper, and then we'll give them a bath, and then we'll put them to bed," she said. "Oh, we will, we will. And what exactly are we giving them for supper?" And how will we get hot water at this time? And even more to point, how are we gonna put them to bed, Missus Mad? We blinked at her. She wasn't like any of the servants I read about in books. They wear uniforms and say "Madam" a lot and did as they were told. They didn't argue or ask lots of questions in rude tone of voice or call their mistress cheeky nicknames to her face, Missus Mad. Perhaps Mrs. Waverly was a little mad. She acted a little mad, lying on her Victorian sofa in that dressing gown garment, her hair floating past her shoulders. She didn't seem physically ill. She was tall and imposing, with a biggish chest. She could have made two small, skinny chubbies, but as she seemed like an invalid, perhaps she was mentally ill. I stared at her fearfully. I've seen mad people on the streets, shuffling along, talking to themselves. Once a madman had started shouting at me. Another had opened up his coat and done something so astonishingly rude. I couldn't possibly have told my mother. I've never known any mad people though. I hadn't read about any in a book. Though I knew about the mad woman in Jane Eyre because I glanced at a scary comic strip version. The mad woman had long hair and long dresses too, but her face was purple and bloated with rolling eyes. Thank goodness Mrs. Waverly's face was pale pink, and her eyes were lovely, big and very blue. She was peering, pleaded at Chubby. Well, you might. You look at me. You are the one who insists. Sis, I'm taking the girl, and then this great string being a, a boy. I just wanted the baby. That's all," said Chubby. 
She picked up Archie. She was tottering with exhaustion. There now, little man, come with Chubby. She said, marching across the room in her pom pom slippers. They were worn down at the back, so they made a contemptuous little flapping sound as she moved. I stood there. Kevin did too. His head bent. Chubby and Archie disappeared through the door. Mrs. Waverly sat where she was on the chaise lung, fidgeted with her hands. I realized she was bringing them. I've read this phrase in books, but I've never quite understood it. I've seen Mom wring wet clothes, but she did so fiercely that the water streamed out. If she strung her own hands like that, she would have broken all her fingers. Mrs. Waverly grinned more soft and ineffectually. Chubby, she called. The slippers stopped clanging. Come on, you two big ones, follow me! Chubby shouted impatiently. I bob my head at Mrs. Waverly and hurry out of the door. Kevin following me. Our suitcase stood in a row in the hall. My big one, Kevin's medium bash one, and Archie's tiny cardboard one. They look as if they belong to three bears. I said. Kevin didn't answer. His head was turned away from me. We went in a long corridor with bare floorboards, scurrying after Chubby. I saw that Kevin was snuggling his eyes. Don't cry, I said. I'm sure they'll let you stay here. He glared at me. I ain't cry, he said, and I don't want to stay here with them. Too deaf, old woman. So shut your face. I was appalled. How could he be so rude to me when I tried so hard to help him? He was a stupid, horrible, ungrateful boy, and I would never try to be kind to him again. The door at the end of the corridor was ajar. I hesitated. Kevin did too. Come on, then, you gormless kids! Chubby called. We went into a large kitchen with a flag stone floor and a big wooden table. And a wooden dresser with a drawer handles in the shape of a heart. Oh, I love those hearts! I said. I wish our dresser at home was like that. She had it specially made. Said Chubby, sitting Archie on the corner of the kitchen table. Don't fall off now. She commanded him. She filled a kettle and put it on the hob. Then she opened the larder hob. The larder door. I expected to be full of jams and jellies and pies and pastry because this was such a grand house. But it looked almost as a bare of old mother's herbs. She opened a bread bin and lifted a plate, covering two slices of grayish meat, touching dubiously. It's hers and mine, and it looks like it's on the turnoff anyway. She muttered to herself. Better get them bread and milk. Best get them clean first. She poured the nearly boiling water into the enamel washing up bowl and found a rag and a silver of red life boy washing up, a life boy soap. She attached Archie first, scrubbing his face and his hands and his blackened knees. He giggled, protested bitterly. "Keep still, you silly little baby," said Chubby. "I'm not a bleeding baby," Archie protested, and then shrieked as soon with his eyes. "Jeepers! What a fuss! And I would think I was trying to murder you. All right, you're not a baby. You're a squirmy little skin rabbit." Said Chubby, laughing at him. I remember Mom said I look like a rabbit. It seemed at least six weeks ago. Not that very morning, my stomach felt hollow and achy. I miss Mom so. I miss Dad too. I wanted everything to be normal again. Back at our old house before we had to move. I'll be sitting in the sitting room. And sitting on the sofa, reading my library book, and Dad will be back from work. Flicking through the Evening Standard and sharing the comic strip with me, there would be a lovely, rich, savory smell of pork chops or macaroni cheese or shepherd's pie. Because Mom was in the kitchen making supper, whistling if she was in a good mood. What are you rubbing your front for? Chubby asked me, wiping Archie dry with an inquisitive tea towel. Got a bellyache? I blush. Mom would never let me say the word belly, not even belly button. I shook my head. My tummy feels funny. 
I mumbled. You're probably hungry. I'll get cracking with your suppers and have a tick. Just got to get you all washed. You next. Chubby dripped the drag in Archie's now murky water and rubbed it with soap. Come on. I stared her appalled. I can't wash myself, I protested. And can't I have clean water? No, you can't. I'm not falling about boiling another kettle. What's the matter with this? She dipped her elbow in a bowl. It's still nice and hot, but it's dirty from Archie. Yes, and it'll get even dirtier from you. She handed me the soap rag. You do it then and be quick about it. I've got a proper final in my suitcase. I'll go and get it. I suggested. Chubby sighed irritably. Look, Lady Muck, you're in my kitchen, and you'll do as I say. Get your face and hands washed now, and you'll be given, though some sore knees, a proper shookin too. Lady Muck, Kevin sniggered. He attempted an imitation. I've got a proper flannel. Not your cheek now, said Chubby, but she was smirking too. There was eight of us when I was a kid, and we was lucky if we had a bath once a week, and that was after our mom and dad. You have seen the color of the water when our Jimmy, the youngest, got in it, like brown Windsor soap, yet he never complained. I took the hateful rag and got on with washing myself. My lips pressed together. It was awful having to wash in front of them all. Well, we had to back in front of each other, too. If I have to strip off in front of Kevin, I'll die immediately. My knees stung horribly when I dab at them. When I was finished and Kevin was giving himself a lick and a promise, Chubby came at me with an evil-looking bottle. What's that? I asked fearfully. It's just a gentian violet. I'll put on a spot on both them knees and they'll heal up in no time. She poured a little on a piece of cotton wool and said too. It was dark purple and stung terribly, but I was too proud to make a fuss. I was worried the purple might stain the hem of my gold plated skirt and hitch it up cautiously when at last we sat down at the kitchen table to have supper, bread and milk. I was interested to see what it tasted like. Children in books were often given it when they were tired or sick. It was simply warm milk with lumps of bread mashed up it. But Chubby had sprinkled it with sugar too. It slipped down easily and was very comforting. <laughs> Reminding me of the sugar sandwich and a glass of milk I had for breakfast so long ago. There, said Chubby, when she saw my empty bowl. I bet her your belly feels better now. You were just hungry. Kevin and Archie had woofed theirs down too. Archie even picked his bowl up and licked all around it. I thought Chubby would tell him off, but she just laughed. Now, let's take you to the toilet, she said. It was like being back in the nursery class. Still at least, she didn't insist to recall it in the WC. Chubby went in with Archie, but thank goodness she let Kevin and then me manage by ourselves. There was a nice solid wooden toilet seat, and it was mercifully clean. In our new flat, we had to share a toilet with a lady downstairs, and Mom was always having rows with her because she didn't use the toilet brush or any disinfectant. Ew. All right. There now, said Chubby. Archie rubbed his eyes and give an enormous john. Well, I suppose we ought to put you to bed somehow, get them suitcase and bring them upstairs. She saw that I was struggling and Kevin didn't seem inclined to help. So she set Archie on his feet and sent him tottering up while she held my suitcase up the stairs for me. Then she stood on the landing, panting, her hand on her flat chest. That was knackery. She said, setting it down. She looked up and down the landing if she was suddenly lost and didn't know which way to go. Then she sighed and led us along to the no to the right and opened a door halfway down. We peered inside and then did a double take. It was empty. Not just spiritually finished, but completely empty. Though there were curtains at the window, but there were no carpet, no dressing table, no chairs, no washstand, no beds whatsoever. Chubby flip flop over the bare floorboards and set my case down with a thump. You're best sleep in here, she said. 
We stared at her. There's no beds, Missus," said Kevin. "I ain't a Missus, but I'm a Miss. You can call me chubby like everyone else. I know there's no beds. I don't know what Missus Matt want me to do. Work a bally miracle? Hang on a sec." She left us standing there, utterly baffled. Archie walked all around the room as if expecting to bump into an invisible bed any second. Kevin and I look at each other. She's gone off her head, he said. Why has she dumped us in here when it's empty? I said. Why can't we sleep in the proper bedroom? Search me, said Kevin. Let's find one. He went out of the room. Kevin, I don't think it's allowed. I whispered. That's Chubby right down the end. I can hear her rummaging. He said. Come on. He walked a few steps to the rummaging. To the next door and opened it cautiously. It was another completely empty room. Oi, oi! Chubby called from along the corridor. Stay put, you lot! I'm just coming. He went back to the first room and stood there awkwardly, shuffling from foot to foot, completely unnerved. Here we are. They're all sheets, all sides to middle, but they're all still decent quality. I can't rustle up no blankets, but it's still summer, so you should be all right. And there's no spare mattress. But look, I'm giving you the indoor down of my own bed. It's so lovely and soft and fluffy. So come on, girl, help me get a little shipshape," she said, nodding at me. But where's the bed? I asked helplessly. For God's sake, can't you see? There aren't any beds. Just two in the whole house. One for Mrs. Mann and one for me. She's not gonna share with you lot, and certainly not either. So you can keep here, the three of you," she said. The three of us. You mean I gotta sleep with the boys? I ask. What's wrong with that? I slept with all my brothers and sisters when we was little. We top and tail too, so it wasn't too much of a squash," said Chubby. Lucky job, he was all on the skinny side. But these boys aren't my brothers. I've never met them before today," I said, thinking she simply hadn't understood. What's up to you? Little Miss Fussy, you can't sleep next door by yourself if that was if that was you want. But I haven't got any more spare bedding, so you're gonna be pretty chilly and uncomfy. Or you can huddle up there so yourself. Night, night now," said Chubby. Archie started crying as she went to the door. "Come on, don't disturb that boo-hooing little man," she said. But she went back and gave him an awkward hug. "Settle down, stands." To reason, you feel a bit humpy being dumped here with us, but you'll feel better in the morning, and then you can run around in the garden and climb trees and paddle in the lake. You have a, such a lovely time, and you see lots of rabbits and squirrels and heaps of other animals. I want to see them cows," said Archie, but he let Chubby take his tight jumper and shorts off and settle him in the middle of the makeshift bed, still wearing his tatty vest and pants and socks. There are you two big one hop in either side of them," said Chubby. "Night night again." We're still too dumbfounded to reply. I knew one thing. I wasn't gonna strip off in front of Kevin, not for all the tea in China. I took my suitcase and dragged in next door. This room was even bleaker than the one Chubby had chosen for us. It seemed darker. I kept looking around, wondering if there was anyone standing you, if anyone standing very still in a corner, waiting to get me. I unsnapped my suitcase, and it sounded incredibly loud in the still room. I fumbled around for my nightdress, then quickly pulled my jumper over my head and dived into my nightie, so that I would be decent if the boys came burgling it. I took the rest of my clothes up underneath. It felt chilly. In the empty room, but I knew Mom would hate it if I went to bed in my underwear. Though of course I didn't have a bed, so I didn't want to have a curl with Kevin and Archie. I decided I'll simply sleep where I was and show them all. I lay down on the floor, but the bare boards were incredibly cold and hard. They felt dusty too, and I was wearing a clean nightie. I had no covers to pull over me, and worst of all, I didn't have a pillow. My neck was hurting. After hauling my heavy suitcase around, I thought of my soft pillow at home and longed to nestle in it. With the crook of my neck properly cradled, it was a mistake to think of home. I pictured mom, 
all alone than being blown up by a German bomb the moment war was declared. I thought of Dad fighting all of the Germans, and then them shooting him. Bang, 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 like in a cowboy movie. Even though my tummy was full of bread and milk, I had an empty feeling. My eyes were watery, and my nose prickled. I rubbed my eyes and pinched my nose. It was so weirdly quiet in the country. I wish I could hear cars going past, footsteps, chatter. I couldn't start crying again now. The boy next door would hear. Even Chubby might hear her bedroom, which is along the corridor. She might be cross or poke fun at me. She didn't mind Archie crying. He was only little after all, but she'll think me too old. She didn't seem to like me anyway. I could just hear her chanting, cry baby. I am not, not gonna cry. I said it to myself over and over again, and whenever a tear dripped down my cheek, I knuckled my eye hard to punish it. I wanted to distract myself by reading, but it was too dark to see the pages, and I didn't want to have a night lamp or a torch. Of course, there was a proper light switch for the door. I fidgeted, wondering whether I dare put it on. Mom didn't allow me to switch the light on again after she kissed me goodnight. She was always fussing about electricity bills, but Mrs. Weverly must be very rich to live in such an enormous house. Perhaps she wouldn't mind if I read just for 10 minutes. I jumped up and switched on the light, hoping it wouldn't show through the makeshift playing out curtain. I took ballet shoes out of my case and sat cross legged with it under the light. The bear bob must have been a very low watt because I could still barely see. I had to hold my book uncomfortably close to my face. I could just read about the first page, partly because I particularly knew it by heart. But I didn't seem to lose myself in the story. I wanted to walk along the Cromwell Road with Pauline, Petrova, and Posey. But I stayed shivering on the bare floor of a strange house in the middle of nowhere. I flicked through the book, looking at the illustrations, picture that had become like a family photo album to me. That worked better. I even stood up, bunched up my nightie into a ballet dress shape, and tried twirling around the room. And for a few seconds, I was dancing a magical duet with Posey. And I stumbled and subsided in embarrassment. I raised my stupid to try to put together a makeshift bed. I ended lying on Orlando, the marmalade cat, with tomorrow's clean knickers and sock tucked and set my jumper as a pillow. I pucked, I put out the light, and in the dark room arranged my best smoke dress on top of me, hoping I wasn't roll over in the night and crease it. I was sure I wouldn't be able to sleep a wink, and so I started making up a story about Pauline, Petrova, and Posey and me evacuated to the country. We were to share facilities with Street Agatha's convent, so I could be by, so I could be best friends with Jessica. Oh yeah, how I miss Jessica. Then Pauline, Petrova, and Posey faded away, and Jessica and I were being told of by Sister Josephine, Charlie Chaplin. And suddenly she wasn't like a Charlie Chaplin anymore. She was spitting image of Hitler with his toothbrush mustache. She actually became Hitler, though she's still wearing her nun's wimple and habit. She shouted and ranted at us, and we clutched hands and ran. And she charged after us. Her hobnail boots suddenly huge, marching left, right, left, right, left, right. And then I woke up, stiff all over. Oh Lord, that was a bad dream of all. It was light which made the empty room look even odder. I stretched out, trying to get more comfortable, but I kept sliding off Orlando. And anyway, I didn't want to lie on top of him anymore. I knew it was ridiculous, but the picture of Orlando on the front of the book looked very flat. I didn't want to squash him all together. I stood up, yawning and rubbing all my worst aching bits. I needed to go to the toilets. I needed to go so badly that I couldn't possibly wait until breakfast. If there was any, I just, I couldn't even wait. I just read knickers. I couldn't even wait until I washed and dressed. 
I pulled on yesterday naked to stop feeling quite so bare, and Vuneral stuck my feet into my red shoes and hobbled up in search of a WC. I knew not to try next door, because that only contained Kevin and Archie. I timidly peered up into the rooms on either side of the corridor, but they were empty too. The situation was getting urgent. I knew there was a toilet downstairs, so I made a rush for it. My shoe is biting now. They made a loud clatter on the bare wooden stairs, and I looked about me fearfully, worried that I might be disturbing Chubby or Mrs. Walverly, but no one came. I found the right door at last and sat on the toilet, mightily relieved. I shook my head sadly at the state of my red shoes. I wasn't so sure Chubby would have the right sort of polish and be able to get them shine properly again. When I came to the corridor, I heard faint scuffling sound coming from the kitchen. Perhaps Chubby was starting to make the breakfast. I wondered what it would be. Maybe more bread and milk? Perhaps if I offered her to help her lay the table, she would start to like me a little. I walked into the kitchen. Chubby wasn't there. It was Kevin and Archie fully dressed with a sugar packet and a slab of butter between them on a table. We're having sugar fingers, Archie crowded. Look, you do it like this. He dug his finger into the butter, then wiggled it around his sugar packet. It tastes lovely, it does, he said, sucking his finger appreciatively. You're a cop if Chubby catches you, I said, though my mouth was watering. It's her fault. We're starving. Fancy only giving us bread and milk. My dad said I'll be fed rurally in the country, bacon and sausages and a great big steaks. He'll do his nuts if he knew they were just giving us bread and milk, said Kevin. What about your dad, Archie? Kevin shrugged. Don't see him anymore. Maybe Archie's dad is dead, I said. I'm pretty sure Archie would be able to spell yet. Here, Archie. Shirley here says your dad's dead, said Kevin. No, I didn't. I protested. He's not. He's in the neck, said Archie, dabbing his finger in the butter and sugar again. In the where? I said, looking at Kevin. The neck, he repeated. You know, prison. I looked at Archie, horrified. Oh, you poor thing. What did your dad do? He struck, he struck again. I don't know. Stuff? Rubbery and that? He went down for a long stretch because he had a shooter. I blinked at her. He seemed to have jumped out of a gangster movie. And then, he, yet he was only still little Archie. I pictured him his dad like a big Archie, bald in blue pants, wearing suit with a fedora and had a gun in each hand. And then, he jumped up to the round of the door of the back of the kitchen. Yeah, Archie, not his dad. It opens into a scullery with a big stone sink and various buckets. There was another door beyond it and a big bolt. He struck with it again. He had it open in a couple of seconds and then he was out. Kevin and I looked at each other and then followed him. Finally, we were out. All right, so there will be chapter eight. Where are they going and what will happen to Archie? I think I look at the picture and he had fallen off the river. Oh no. Let's find out in chapter 8. Bye.